continuing my journey through the letter of Ephesians. Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. And it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. It's quite a quick rush through Ephesians because there's a lot in it as a letter. There's a lot of richness to the text and so much I could say. I'm trying to keep it quite uh, light in terms of the the overview and quite brief. But I'm just trying to dive into each chapter and bring out some thoughts, uh, which I don't think gives the letter any justice, but uh, just a little bit of a taster for those who are wanting to look at the letter of Ephesians. It's good to listen through it. It's good to read through it. And it's good to reflect on the verses which are there as well. Maybe use different translations, use different uh uh, frameworks so you get a, a fresh idea of of the letter don't become over familiar with uh, perhaps the translation that you're used to using so I'm going to go into uh, the second part of Ephesians chapter 2 I just feel like I need to say a few bits from from that because I don't felt didn't feel like I gave it justice uh, in my other video um, so I'm just going to read now from Verse 14, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules in order to create out of the two races one new people in union with himself. In this way, making peace. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed their enmity by means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. So Christ came and preached the good news of peace to all, to you Gentiles who are far away from God and to the Jews who were near to him. It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, are able to come in the one spirit in the presence of the Father. So then, you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. He is the one who holds the whole building together and makes it grow into a sacred temple dedicated to the Lord. In union with, with him, you too are being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. So those last verses from verse 14 to verse 22 talk about this unity that has happened so there was a big dividing wall there was a big barrier between jew and gentile between those that were within the covenant at the time and those who were not and god has done something very special through the death of christ brought us together because his plan is to draw back all men into this eternal plan of his salvation and purpose and it's important too that you know when when god has as, as it were built one layer of the temple he's wanting to add on top of it but the the baseline the the real cornerstone the 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 the, the strength of this building is the cornerstone christ jesus so it's key that he is the foundation for us and the the one in which we find our stability and our unity as well and and so we see christ doing something quite spectacular i've been looking recently at uh, the book of one kings and it begins to talk about solomon and the temple that solomon built and it's amazing when you look at the details and the the lavishness and the and the cost and uh, tremendous care that was put into that temple the the workmanship and uh, the skills and uh, the uh, amazing amount of time and energy and effort. And then I, I was struck by the fact that seven years were spent over this uh, tremendous building. And then you read after that that Solomon spent 13 years on his palace and thinking, OK, well, it's pretty amazing, the temple, but uh, the palace seemed to be an even bigger project. And he got carried away with all sorts of projects in his life. And Ecclesiastes talks about this. He poured himself into all manner of massive projects. Uh, he was a man of great wealth 
and resources. So it's all proportional, really, isn't it, in terms of our investment. And Christ has put an investment into this purpose that he has to build this temple, which is everything, everything, everything of him, everything of his sacrifice, everything is poured into this temple. And so uh, it's not like Solomon where tremendous resources put in for sure um but it wasn't the only thing he invested in uh in some ways and then you also see sadly you know although he had great wisdom and although he had great wealth there's also a lot of slipping away in his life that happens compromises and in some ways he had everything and yet some of those things drew his heart away from uh really god being the first place and it's it's very sad. It's a very very heartbreaking story because we see the glory of God coming in into Solomon's temple. This amazing, you know, high point I think of 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 Israel's history, and and yet we see the the tragedy later on of uh, the Babylonians coming and destroying that temple and the people being exiled. And so many times the Lord warns them because their hearts have gone astray. So we see something so much more beautiful and wonderful a temple that god is building through christ and that has included us and built us in and he has done something amazing which was that it's uh, not only the jewish people but he's included all people there was a there was an area for the outside for the gentiles you could kind of look on and see it from a distance as it were um but there was a lot of stress around gentiles coming into the temple courts there was a, a lot of problems with access uh in the old system of things and in actual fact um one of the things we notice in the book of acts is paul at one point had a a, a, a man with him in his team who was gentile and people started accusing him of, of being of, of bringing this gentile into the temple courts which he hadn't actually done but uh that was the accusation it was a and it was a very inflammatory accusation to be making um, towards someone like Paul and that caused tremendous problems so it was a very tense issue as well and God is doing something which is uh, incredible is that he's bringing us into this covenant he's drawing us into this experience and so he's broken down this barrier that stopped uh, access but by including those from the outside he's, he hasn't contaminated or or compromised or or diminished what he was doing in actual fact he's just uh, opened up the invitation uh to uh to so many other people to come in and uh, take part of this to share in this and and so he's joined us into this uh, tremendous privilege and so um i just wanted to go on a little bit to Ephesians chapter three and read from that as well just to include uh that as well and so I'm going to just read a short passage out of Ephesians chapter 3, uh, just to focus in a little bit uh, from that chapter. And uh, this is what it says from verse 7. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. And are making all people see how God's secret plan uh, is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden throughout all the past ages, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Christ Jesus our Lord. In union with Christ and through our faith in him, we have the boldness to go into God's presence with all confidence. I beg you then not to be discouraged because I am suffering for you. It is all for your benefit. And just reading on just a little bit into uh, from, from verse 14. For this reason, I fall on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth receives its true name. I ask God that from the wealth of his glory, to give you power through his spirit to be strong in your inner selves. And I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts through faith. I pray that you may have your roots and foundation in love so that you, together with all God's people, 
may have the power to understand how broad and long and high and deep is Christ's love. Yes, you come to know his love, although it can never be fully known, and so be completely filled with the very nature of God. To him, who by means of his power working in us, is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time, for ever and ever. Amen. It's a, it's a wonderful prayer at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. And I, just reading that first part from 7 up to 13, Paul comes in again, and I've, I, I was thinking about this recently, he comes in um, really from a point of humility. Um, uh, he recognises, he, he calls himself the least of God's people. He was a very uh, powerful, arrogant, intimidating um larger than life figure uh before he encountered christ and he becomes somebody who's uh humbled um because he sees the great riches of god's mercy and grace towards him he's a man whose life has turned around so much and he recognizes god has a secret and purpose plan uh, a secret plan and purpose to bring in uh, a new order of things and he uses the body of Christ, he uses God's people as this mechanism to deal with these powers that are um, incredibly uh, overwhelming and humanly we couldn't deal with them. But through Christ, uh, uh, he chooses to use ordinary people backed up by the power of the Holy Spirit, not backed up by their own strength or wisdom or, or um, uh, uh, intelligence, but uh, backed up by the power of the Holy Spirit working through them which is incredible which is amazing it's, it's an incredible opportunity that believers have uh, when they feel confronted by the the very overwhelming uh, cosmic powers that they might be dealing with and uh, circumstances over their town or city uh, or their nation issues that might feel um, that they are so small uh, to stand up against and yet uh, there's something important here is that god is with them it's like the uh the man that uh uh elisha was with and said lord open his eyes and see around him the chariots of god the uh, the heavenly armies around him help him to get perspective uh to see beyond uh the limitations that they had humanly at that point and so um going on to the prayer i I feel just this prayer is um, such a, a beautiful prayer, such an amazing biblical prayer. It's a wonderful one to pray. And I just want to use that now just to pray, whoever's watching this video, just to pray for you. So I want to pray before the Father, from whom every family or all fatherhood in heaven and earth derives its name. Ask that the wealth of his glory give you power through his spirit to be strong in your inner selves i pray that christ will make your home make his home in your hearts through faith i pray that you may have your roots and foundation in love and that you may together with all god's people have the power to understand how broad and long and high and deep is christ's love and to be experiencing this uh, ongoing journey this feeling uh that that we don't fully know yet, but we're on the way towards knowing, especially when we meet him. And I pray that you will know um, that the, by means of his power working in us, he's able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. And may God uh, receive that glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all time, forever and ever. Amen. Many blessings and may the rich blessings that come straight out of the letter of Ephesians uh, also uh, be very much evident in my life, your life and in our lives in these days to come.